he's um, surviving. But for those of you that um, that do pray and feel a burden, please go and bless him with <laughs> you know, with something. Just call him more. <laughs> it's always a dad being alone with his the kids um, need support. So please. Um, it's nice to have the Diakas here tonight as well in the full. Uh, it's it's always Elaine. Elaine works night shifts, so it's um, on on and uh, normally on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, do the roast there at uh, the restaurant. Um, so we are jealous that you are eating so nice, but um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's nice to have you, here, Elaine. Um, Guys, yes, I want to continue in Revelations, and um, you know, it's uh, it's a beautiful part that's lying ahead because it's quite intense. <laughs> um, chapter four, as I said, is about the future, and it um, it progresses in its severity. Um, so it's it's not it's not always easy chapters to go through but um, I believe that tonight will help you at least to get to understand a few principles that um, that uh, that would help you understand revelations better and especially uh, God's heart for humankind so chapter 6 of of revelations um, tonight and um, you know, it, it's the four horsemen of the e apocalypse, and uh, it's, uh, believe it or not, it, it's severe, but it's not the most severe of um, the judgments um, that's coming. Um, but it's good to know, and, and, and I think the urgency in our hearts must grow within the understanding of the times that we are living in. The more I read this, you know, and the more I just study uh, Revelation, I um, I just realized that we are already in the death pangs, you know, of of humankind, and um, and you, when you hear these things, you you realize, guys, we must pray for our kids, we must pray for, you know, for the future generations, we must ourselves be ready, um, but it also puts an urgency within our hearts not to be fearful of the future, um, but to prepare ourselves. Now, you know, if you're an unbeliever. Um, and you don't believe the word of God, you know, it feels like a story to you. And um, But for us as believers, we know that it's the truth. And as we see it unfold, we know that our God is faithful. And that even gives us the assurance that our God will look after his people. That he had a plan from the beginning, and it always included our faithfulness, but it uh, especially included his faithfulness to fulfill that which he um, has promised. And so... When we read these things, it's just amazing to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament get together and, um, and the full picture of how God orchestrated, you know, humankind and his plan to reunite himself with humankind um, is coming to a fulfillment. And so the four horsemen, I just want to show you the picture quickly uh, because it might... Um, yeah, don't get sleepless nights about this, but um, at least it will give you a picture of the four horses that we will be talking um, about tonight. Uh, the white horse, the red fiery horse, the black horse, and then the pale horse, or they say kind of greenish. Well, <laughs> but um, if you can remember those pictures, um, and then uh, as we, we read it in Revelation, it will help you to understand what we are reading. So chapter 4 and 5, I just want to get back to that again, uh, was about revealing Jesus as being the worthy one to open the seals. So we remember God sitting on the throne, John saw God, and then um, God had the scroll in his hand and he presented it and he said, who is worthy to open the scroll? And, um, and Jesus then was clearly... Um, the the one that um, that are worthy the one that um, opens the scrolls and now we see how we one for one open the different seals now i just want to say that um, you know revelation work in sevens and there's a lot of sevens in revelation and it's it always represents the the perfect number but it's also with the judgments that we're talking about 
there is three different judgments that will come on the earth during the tribulation period. Now, the one is the seven seals judgment, and that we will be speaking about tonight. Um, then the seven trumpet judgments that will come, um, which is even more severe. And then the seven bowl judgments, which is even more severe. And it's, um, it's terrible things that's coming um, on this earth. I just want to make sure that all of you understand and, um, and know that what we believe as Christians, especially in our church um, environment as well, we believe that God is really going to rapture his children before these wraths um, of God will strike the earth. Okay, there's a reason why the rapture, uh, not the rapture, the um, tribulation will be coming to the earth. And, um, and one of it is God is a just judge. The fact that God always said that he will bring judgment toward those who's not choosing him, but those who sinned on the earth. Because he is a just God that hates sin and he is perfect and holy and he wants to restore humankind to its holy state that he has made it to be. And in order to do so, he must bring judgment to the earth. And, um, and, and therefore... The, the beautiful thing about year chapter 6 to 18, which is all about the judgments, um, is the fact that you always see God's heart to prolong, to actually um, give more chance and more grace and more mercy toward people to make a choice to follow Him um, and to get the opportunity to soften their hearts and turn to Him and restore themselves uh, to, to Him. Now, rather go through the difficulty and, and come to that revela revelation so that you will receive the eterni eternity uh, with God that, um, that God wants, um, than to harden your heart and be bitter and miss what God wants to do. So these seals would be um, little ropes around a, um, yeah, well, a rolled up paper or, you know, um, scroll and um and within that you have these wax you know seals that um, that seals it and now jesus is busy breaking up um open these seals one at a time and so let's start with revelation 6 verse 1 to 2 now i watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and i heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder come and I look and behold a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out of out conquering and to conquer now many people mistake this first rider which is a rider on a white horse uh, with Jesus and and I, I just want to say if you if you read the rest of Revelations, you soon discover that, you know, this is not Jesus on this white horse. Um, I want to maybe, maybe we should jump to Revelations 19 quickly, just to show you the picture of Jesus sitting on a white horse. Then you will get a better picture of um, how powerful he is. Verse 11 of chapter 19 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on its call faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flame of fire, and on his head are many di diadems. And he had, has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will th thread, um, uh, tread down the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, th so when you read this picture of Jesus sitting on a white horse it's so powerful and um, and often we mistake in Revelations 1 um, the one sitting on the white horse because first of all I can tell you it's not Jesus because he wears a crown 
and he wants to go and conquer, but he's actually the one that deceives. Um, and Jesus will be coming with the white horse at the end of the tribulation period. And here we see this um, rider coming in the beginning of um, the uh, 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 tribulation period. Now, this is certainly the Antichrist, and um, which come with the, uh, the picture of the angel of light. And therefore, it seems like the blessed one, the anointed one, but it is um, disguised in deception. And so it's also a picture in the last days that when it gets to the tribulation period, that deception will be a lot more evident around us, that we will be deceived. And if we don't know the voice of God, certainly, hi Elizabeth, it's great to have you guys here. It's really a blessing. Um, the, I must find my story again. Uh, yes, back to the angel of, of light. So in the days that, we, that is coming, we must remember that the enemy will do anything to disguise himself as the angel of light, as the one that actually is bringing the solutions to the earth rather than to be uh, the one that brings destruction. And, and so the first picture that we see then is this um, uh, a rider on the white horse, uh, but he's got a bow with him and um, with no arrow and it seems to be the one that's not coming to fight that is actually coming to bring peace and yet he's not and so 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1 to 3 says now concerning the times and the seasons brothers you have no need to have anything written to you for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So we understand this to be the Antichrist and um, he uh, will definitely, especially in the tribulation period, and we'll get to it a little bit later in Daniel as well, um, the first three and a half years will look like the angel of light. He will look like the one that brings all the solutions to the earth. And then he will turn his back and he will um, uh, turn from his de deceitfulness to a place where he asks people to, um, to bow their knee toward him. So let's, let's go, go to Daniel chapter 9, which gives a lot more clarity about these prophecies on the tribulation uh, front. And, and if you get the time, please go and read Daniel, uh, especially chapter 9, you know, and, um, and the surrounding chapters, which talk about the pictures that Daniel has seen for the Jewish people. Now, maybe I should just say that tonight. When we read these things, it's clear that God has a plan, but especially with the Jewish people. And so whenever we as Christians, and, 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 and um, if I say that, I want to say it in context, when it gets to the timeline that we are following toward the end, end days. So we, the Jews are not more important than Christians. <laughs> Let's be clear about that. Uh, the Jews are not more special or uh, a more important um, you know, uh, nationality that will be privileged in the last days. But God has a different plan with the Jewish nation. And so when we see these things... God always projected his plans through the prophets in how he related to his people, the Jewish nation, and how he will return back to the Jewish nation um, in his second coming, and, um, and that their eyes will be opened when he comes back. So the deception that will happen, the, th three and a half, the first three and a half years of Revelation, will allow the, the Jews to actually see him as the savior of the times and um, seasons that we are in. And they will be fully uh, falling into a deception that, um, that will keep them um, to, 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 to the hold of the Antichrist. And so maybe I should just say this. 
one thing is for certain and that we must remind ourselves over and over about when we read these things is you realize that no politicians or great leaders will be able to save us in the times to come. The only one that can save us in what's about to happen in the future is to follow Christ and His voice and He will lead us and we will hear His voice and we will not be deceived. But it will be easy to fall for the flesh. It will be easy to fall for the schemes of the enemy. Because whatever looks like the right option will not necessarily be the right option. I remember in COVID times, you know, we prayed and one of the words that got out was that everything is not as it seems. And, um, and, and we know it. These days you look you know, at, at all of the media and we, we joke about it. Uh, you know, the false media and uh, the conspiracy theories and, and all these things. Um, and, and that's part of the seasons that would come upon the earth where you will not know what to believe. And how to believe it. And that's why it's even more important to hear God's voice so much clearer. And he says, I'm your shepherd. And if you hear my voice, you will follow me. You will know what to do in times to come. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Um, and this is a little bit um, of, of a difficult part. But I want to make sure that um, you guys understand how significant it is in connecting with Revelation 6, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it says, 70 weeks, and this was God's promise through Daniel to God's people in saying that you will have 70 weeks of the creed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint a most holy place. So, so uh, maybe I should just read it again because you might uh, miss it. It says, um, finish the transgression and it says here, a decree about your people. So 70 weeks, they will have the time, the Jewish people um, and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint, anoint a most holy place. Now, in order to understand this, we must get to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 then. Um, and, and this might be, especially for those of you that don't like maths, uh, please forgive me, but tonight I just want to give uh, some extra insight in how precious uh, these timelines are. Verse 26, it says, And after the 62 uh, weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Now, let me get back quickly. So, within Daniel chapter 9, and I don't have time to read the whole chapter, so please go and, and, and tonight make sure that your pastor is not lying, uh, that he's actually speaking the truth. Um, but Daniel uh, gives a vision about, he says, 62 sevens and seven and one sevens, so which means that 62 plus a seven gives you 69 uh, weeks that he speaks of and this represent in God's time calendar as years so if if you talk about uh, 62 sevens it's 62 times seven uh, which comes to a number of about 434 years and um, and then one seven which is seven times seven is 49 um, that brings at the end uh, you to an amount of 483 years. Why am I putting this on the table tonight? Is it's so significant because actually if you look at these numbers, uh, the Israel nation could actually predict that Jesus' first coming to the dot, to the T, to the exact day if they worked it out on these specific weeks and years. So if you, if you take the 69 or the, yeah, the 69 um, times seven 
uh, which is 483 years. And you, um, you look at the calendar that um, at this stage Daniel is speaking about. At this stage, Daniel is prophesying about something that happened in Israel's history called the rebuilding of the walls which meant the, the whole city of God being restored to a state where God can meet his people again. So, in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1, it speaks of the de declaration that went out because Nehemiah went to, um, at that stage, the king um, and asked him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the declaration went out that it will, it will be done. So he could go and he could take a lot of resources and people with him to do so. And the significance of the 483 years is because if you take the exact date of the declaration and you take it on 483 years, it brings you to an exact date of the 6th of April, um, 32 A.D., and if you look what happened on that exact day, it was the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem, um, known as the Palm Sunday, as the time when he entered the city uh, to be uh, sung over Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of all Kings. And so if, if you trace it back and you understand how significant it was when Jesus for the first time said to his disciples, listen, now you can call me Messiah. Now you can, can um, shout over my um, uh, uh, um, name that I'm the son of David. It was so significant because Jesus knew that it was a prof prophecy being fulfilled at a time when the Messiah came into Jerusalem for the last time. And we know that Jesus just after that uh, went to the cross. And, and still till to this day, I'm thinking, how could you for the one day sing Hosanna, Hosanna, and throw, throw palm um, trees in the middle of the road so that the king can come in. And people asking, so who is this person? And the next uh, few days, uh, he, um, he goes through the ugly death of uh, being hung on the cross. But it's so significant because God has a story. God has a plan and a purpose for his people and for us as humankind in such a way that he's faithful to it. And so, so when Daniel speaks about the 69, which is now consisting, if I can get back to the numbers again, and I must maybe just um, do it schematically next time, um, 62 weeks plus the 7, which brings us to 69 um, weeks times 7, uh, which means that it's 434 years we also know that this scripture becomes more powerful in Daniel chapter 9. Now let me go back to, to uh, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, now, now let me just be clear. He first speaks about a 7, which is the 7 times 7, which is the 49 years, and then plus the 62 weeks. And there's a very deliberate way in which he presents this number. He, he, he gives this number because the first seven times seven, which is 49 years, was the time that it took to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So, so after the first seven um, that amounted to 49 years, and it took Israel actually 49 years to raise the walls and to complete the work that Nehemiah brought back to um, Jerusalem to be restored. After that, you see the 62 weeks, 62 um, times 7 <laughs> uh, years that gets to be fulfilled, which brings us to a number of 69. And that is definitely not the completion of the full 70 weeks of the plan that God has for his people when he prophesied through Daniel of things that would come. But let's read the, the rest. And it says, one shall be cut off and shall, shall have nothing. Let me read it from the beginning again. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off. And this was Jesus. So after the 69 then, we understand it to be the 7 plus um, the, uh, the 62, which brings us to Jesus' um, uh, uh, declaration of being the Messiah and being the King. Um, 
it says here, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And we know that to be true because um, about 70 AD, uh, the, the full Jerusalem, um, you know, the temple was destroyed. And we know that the Roman occupation led them to destroy everything that was sacred within the city, especially the things of God. And so it ends, uh, its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war. And then it says desolations are decreed. Now let's get to the last week. And, um, and so when we say the last week, uh, we still need that one seven that is left within the 70. Um, and so Daniel chapter uh, 9 verse 26 leads us to that place. And 27 especially uh, give us some answer. And he shall make a strong covenant. And this is now not Jesus anymore. Uh, this is the Antichrist and his work that will come through the times of tribulation. Now, now, we know that the last seven will then be fulfilled through the tribulation time. Because for Jesus to complete the work that he has started within the nation of Israel from Daniel's prophecies, is he must come to those 70 weeks and that last week is the one that we will experience when the persecution comes uh, the great tribulation would be coming to the earth. And this is a time of immense um, the wrath of God coming in such a way that mankind will uh, really feel it. So listen to it again. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Now a week is seven days. Okay, we understand it to be seven days. And for a half the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, which means that he will bring an end to the promises that he brought to the nation of Israel uh, to restore the temple and the offerings that would happen within the temple again. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now, I know this is difficult stuff, but now I want you to, to move with me. Because here we see that uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. This prophecy um, comes to fulfillment. We, we understand that the 69 weeks is past. It's finished. Now, why do we, if you see that all happening in one sequence, find ourselves in a place where today... You know, how many years later, <laughs> uh, we only see the last seven uh, 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 coming to fruition so much later than the rest. And the answer is actually very simple. Is it's as if God brought a stopwatch timer and said, listen, it's now pausing the timeline for his destruction on all mankind. And he says, listen, I brought my son to the world now it's the church's chance to bring in the harvest until my wrath comes to the world so if any you would um, already have heard that we call this dispensation between the already but not yet the um, promise of the son coming to the earth to die for our sins and the time where the great tribulation would come and the wrath of God be spilled over the world, that is the time of the church age. And so the beautiful thing about it is that God actually empowered his church to be the one responsible to bring in the harvest and to, to bring people back to the heart of God within this period. So the, the longer this period takes place, the, the longer you know, the, the church must position itself within this time frame to actually do what Jesus has called it to do because he asked the church to be the caretaker of not just the truth, but every person that will come into his kingdom. And so in this church age, we find ourselves then, now some of you would understand it, especially those who are fathers yet... Um, 
or mothers would understand, you know, um, your children, you give them grace and grace and grace until you get to that point where enough is enough. <laughs> where, uh, where you feel that it's, it's fine to give grace, but it's not at a stage, it's not helping anymore. It's not going to change any behavior um, at all. You must do something more drastic. And this is where God comes in, in his grace to say, listen, when I come to the earth to do what I've promised to do, and that is to be a judge, to be the one to judge against the things that is not right. I'm not going to overlook that which is not, but you have a choice because I will have to judge sin. The only choice lies within are you willing to accept my son's offering to stand on your behalf and take the penalty on your behalf? Or are you going to stand on your own at the day of judgment? And that's why we reach out to everyone that needs to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Because we don't want them to stand before the judgment seat one day trying to fulfill and, and, uh, and, and, and atone for their own sins before a judge that is just and that will not allow any injustice. And it's not that God is merciless. It's because of His mercy that time is coming to such a place that He gives again and again the last opportunities for humankind to understand the severity that's about to happen. That's why these prophecies is um, getting out and why Revelations is written because God again wanted to say it's coming. It's not going to be, a, it's not a secret. These things are going to happen. But make sure to uh, position yourself in the freedom and, um, and within that we don't live in fear. All of us understand that. We all understand that God is not a fearful God. Um, that wants to punish us but it's because of his love and his opportunity that we have to stand before him in a, a relationship that will lead us to amazing um, victory uh, at the cross and so this time of seven years will be the time of the punishment of the Jews for their disobedience and um, uh, it will at the end of the last seven uh, we will see all the nations coming against Israel. We, we see the last war um, coming uh, against Israel. And we also know that that is the time when the King, Jesus, will enter into the picture and his second coming will be happening. So let me just get you back onto a timeline. <laughs> when it gets to the tribulation, God will come back for his people um, before the tribulation happens. But first, he will draw those who died and received him um, as Lord and Savior of their lives while they were alive. Then he will receive those who are still alive and has um, received him. And now within the, 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 the time span of the, the tribulation period, severe difficulty will be upon those who want to still receive Christ, but there will still be a small window of opportunity. So let's get to Revelations 6 verse 3 uh, to 4 then. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth uh, so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword so here we see a progression happening this time this um, living creature on the red um, horse brings violence and division and civil unrest and it takes away the peace upon the earth um, there will be nations that will stand against the antichrist at this time um, and they will try to uh, to oppose him but they will be unsuccessful and uh, again, I want to just um, remind you 
of the birth pangs that we see all around us. You know, nation against nation, um, rising up and um, calling peace, but there's no peace around us. Revelation 6, verse 5 to 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I look, and behold, a black horse. And it's rider now in, um, in the Bible. Just be sure to always, when you read about black, that it um, speaks of famine. Um, and so, um, so keep that in your mind. A black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, um, measure, measuring scales. And uh, I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. Now this is a time when um, there will be a shortage of, of um, very scarce commodities on the earth. Um, it speaks of now uh, four quarts would be enough they say for a soldier to live for one day um, of of um, wheat so it says here a quart of wheat for a denarius which means that it would be so expensive that you would not be able to buy it not even enough to eat for one day um, and so you can only imagine that in this time there will be a fight for resources <laughs> a fight for the scarce commodities that um, that are still on the earth now maybe i should just get back to the previous ones then because if we start with the first one which is peace but there's no peace um, and we get to the second one which is war and nation against nation now you know i was just the other day listening to um to what one uh, uh, um, atom bomb will do these days when it hits a city and i think they said it's about now where's the scientist here among us but it's 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 a lot it's like in hundredfold more than it was at hiroshima at the time it's just the kind of technology that they have these days and the way that it can flatten the earth so so if one of those bombs if a few of these bombs would go, will um, be the kind of warfare that we will see in, um, in this um, time span, you can just imagine, um, you know, they said that when those reactors in Russia, for instance, years ago, you know, um, was melting down, it was um, known that that part of the world, even the cows, you know, were infected. Um, for for years for decades after that um, so you can just imagine when these things happen that it would be a natural outflow of the kind of disaster that will strike the earth so it's it's horrendous <laughs> it's um, it makes the things that we've heard like the first world war and the second world war and um, you know what what is the worst things that humankind you know i was just thinking the other day if you think of, through history what was the worst thing that happened to humankind all of them happened the last 100 150 years the, the most severe things i'm talking about that brought the most of devastation to mankind except for noah and and the devastation that um, the waters brought but world war one world war two um the uh, the plagues Yes, there's a lot more people involved because humankind is so much more. But, um, but still, there's, um, if there's famine, people will experience a severe shortage of, um, of food and they will fight over it. And so the third seal is the one of the black horse and is um, famine. It... Um, the currencies will, will crash, inflation will skyrocket, and then a lack of supplies will be at hand. Let's go to, to the next one, the fourth seal. Revelation 6, verse 7 to 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. 
and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. So this rider of the pale horse is the one that is known as Death. And um, he, he, he received the, um, the task to, uh, to kill a quarter of the world population. Now, if I'm now right, these, you know, intelligent people um, that we have in, in this church that uh, knows how much <laughs> people are on the planet at this moment um, would maybe agree with me that at least between 1.5 billion and 1.8 billion, that's maybe a, a estimate. I think um, China in its whole is 1.3 billion, if I'm, if I'm wrong. Sorry? 1.4 million, a billion, sorry, billion people. So if we talk about 1.8 billion people dying, it's the whole of China and plus, <laughs> you know, um, that, uh, that would die at a time. So you can just imagine what would be the devastation that comes with it. And before you've got um, sleepless nights, let me go to the fifth um, seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had bo um, borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Who were, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So we're talking about those who would still, um, through the tribulation period, go through severe hardship and get the opportunity to still choose Christ and soften their hearts to come to Him. Now, I want to just maybe mention this. Can you imagine a world in absence of those who are saved and morally committed to, to a God that brings justice. If you withdraw all of the Christians out of the world right now, and I'm not saying that other religions don't have beautiful people that, you know, that is blessed. And, but can you imagine the, the kind of chaos that you will find just by... Um, the mere fact that um, people will fight for themselves and their own um, desires. And so, within the fifth seal, we see that still within all of this, there will be people that will be choosing God uh, in the midst of severe persecution. You must remember, as the Antichrist will rule at this time, he will make sure that everyone that wants to make a choice for the living God, for God through Jesus Christ. Um, they will go through immense hardship. And so, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15, to get back to 1 Thessalonians. Um, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So, just to, to remind you as well, that um, the um, within the tribulation time, those who who died would go with those who who received Christ um, and 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 chose God and still were alive at the time. And so, Revelations eight, no, sorry, six, verse twelve to fourteen. When he opened the sixth seal. I look and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a sc scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So, an Im immense earthquake that will um, be on the earth now. You know, they say in Japan's earthquake that um, the last one that was so massive, the, um, 
that I think it was about nine on the Richter scale. It was, you know, the big renowned one. Um, it, it already shifted, you know, the, um, the earth on its axis, which means that a bit, which means that, you know, the water levels already shifted even on the, the coast of, of Japan. Um, so when things like this happens, we'll see immense chaos within the creation as it um, uh, 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 makes shifts of, of birth pangs toward uh, the end. And then Revelations um, 6 verse 15 to 16. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free. So these are the people that think that they rule, they think that they are in control. The people that we often think, God, so why do they get away with it? <laughs> you know, why do they get to, um, to rule on this earth in such a wicked way? Hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is sealed on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, which means that they would at that stage have to admit that there is a God. Because you won't say that if you don't know where this is coming from. They will know that it's the wrath of God coming against humankind and they will respond by saying, just protect me against this. And then, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And so when you read about the great day of the Lord, you know, we sometimes um, think that it's amazing, but I'm telling you, when the judgment of God comes to the nations, it's severe. Joel chapter 2 verse 31 says, The sun shall be turned to black to darkness, and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Zephaniah 1 verse 14, The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. <laughs> this is tough stuff. This is not the kind of stuff that we want to, um, to read. Amos 5. Now you know why you don't spend all of your time in Revelations the whole year. Amos 5 verse 18. Woe to you desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. Now, maybe I should just quickly come back to a more sober and, <laughs> and a positive note at the end of um, this sermon. In conclusion, I wanted to say a few things. The direction the world is going into does not look uh, or does look very bleak without God. Um, we don't need to, to doubt that. History had its destructive moments. World War I, World War II, Hiroshima, tsunami, pandemics. But the final tribulation will be horrifying. Those who choose to return to God's love and relationship will not go through the tribulation. It will be extremely unlikely to choose to follow him during the tribulation. It would be very difficult. God gave mankind numerous times to turn to him and still show his graceful heart until the end. And then he's faithful to his timeline promises toward Israel and we follow that timeline to get to our destiny. We look at what's happening at Israel now. We, uh, we follow that not because we have Israelitis. <laughs> Can I just clarify that? Because some people think becoming more like the Jews and you know um, sh blowing the shofar and <laughs> doing all kinds of Jewish customs and becoming more like the Jew Jews is going to help you to come closer to God. And that's not the truth. 
Okay. Yes, there's context to, to the ways of God. And, but those who, who will have a relationship with God the Father and spend time with Him will be in a place of safety. Because He comes, God comes to reunite Himself with His people. And He wants to restore the world to its holy position. It's, it's restorative position where we again can be with Him in eternity. So in the midst of all of these ugly things that's hitting the earth, let me just remind you that we are not citizens of this earth. We already are citizens and partakers of what God wants us to experience in eternity. And therefore... With his Holy Spirit, you know, it's just amazing that during these times we will be comforted, we will be led, we will have exciting times, even though it's going to be harsh. And let me tell you, this world is not created to be a good place. <laughs> yes, God initially created it as a good place, but we know that it, in its fallen state, it's not a good place to grow up in. It's, you know, the, the Bible even says that our bodies yearns, you know, for, um, for, the, for the day of the Lord, for the fact that we want to get back to God, that we want to receive Him back um, as the Father um, in eternity. And therefore, no politician, worldview or powerful leader will be able to save mankind. God is a just judge and must punish wrongdoing but extend His grace as far as possibly uh, that is possible to help us choose life with Him. We must learn to follow His voice in order not to be deceived. Maybe I should just mention this as well. I've written it here as a side note. God pours time of the end time clock for the church to get ready before the tribulation happens. God is excited about the church. <laughs> Jesus is coming back for his bride. In the seven years that, you know, this great tribulation will be coming to the earth, and, and I'm, I want to maybe just make a distinction, this is the tribulation of all tribulations. Okay? The, the Bible is clear. It, say, it says that we will have much tribulation. We will have lots of difficulty, hardship here on earth. But that's not what he speaks about when he says, when he speaks about the tribulation. The fact that there is coming a time on earth that will be severe. But the beautiful thing about it is that, um, that God is... Um, preparing his bride and in this time of tribulation it's the time of meeting with his with his bride the time of the bride the time of celebration for um, for those who have chosen him uh, for those who made a choice to be his um, his children and um, and we will be able to to experience a re reunification with him um, in heaven I know I, I thought of reading Matthew 24 how much time do we have give me one moment to to quickly just read through it and um, and I hope that um, that you will understand the the urgency in Jesus's heart before he left his disciples when he spoke about these things um, and how, if you read Revelation, how precise Jesus was actually bringing the kind of um, advice to the people that asked him. So what's going to happen then when the Messiah leaves this earth? So let's, let's read it. Verse 4 of Matthew 24. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for the woman who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen from the beginning of the world. And this is Jesus speaking. Just remember this now. Until now, no and never will be. And if they, those days had not been cut short, no man being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ. Or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say, um, so if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there is the vultures and gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will, be, will mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn this lesson. As soon as its branch comes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near. At the very gates. Truly I say to you. This generation will not pass away. Until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. But concerning that day. And hour. No one knows. Not even the angels of heaven. Nor the son. But the father only. For as were the days of Noah. So will be the coming of the son of man. For as in, these, in those days. Before the flood. They were eating and drinking. Mary, please. Um, blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Maybe I should just go one verse back so that you can hear this again. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing um, so when he comes truly I say to you he will set him over all his possessions but it was uh, but if that wicked servant says to himself thanks my Lord, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and um, at an hour he does not know and will be cut cut him in pieces and put him in with the hypocrites in that place will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth um, Jesus pre-warned these things and you know what
I think through all of this, God's biggest battle is to avenge the enemy. Um, and get rid of these dark times forever to a place where his people can for once have the kind of time with him again that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eve um, of Eden and um, you know it's um, even in all of these wraths that we talk about tonight all of these um, tribulation times I see again and again a father extending his heart to give another chance even after seven years still the, before the trumpet blows he still gives the last chance for people to turn back and it's, it's scary to think that some people will be bitter enough and, um, and, and curse God still um, to his face until the end even though they see um, his might and you know when I, I look at the earth and I, I I realize that you know we will not convince all <laughs> to turn to Christ we will not we will not convince all to, to make a decision for him but if it's only one it's still worth doing it and that's God's heart. God's heart is that His people will be reunited with Him. Father, we come to You in the name of Jesus tonight. And Father, these things that we listen, Father God, and we, we realize that man has become so comfortable. And it still thinks that it can rule himself and it can determine its own destiny. Man still thinks that it's in total control of its own destiny. God, when we read these things, we, we realize that you are a merciful God that loves your people and that extends your grace over and over again. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will give us the opportunity to reach many for you in the days that we live. Many that will experience the kind of life that will lead to abundance. Not because of circumstances. But because of you. May you be the prize for us in these days. May you be the prize to your people. That we will when we go through hardship even in these days that we will remind ourselves that the hope is the eternity that lies ahead a eternity that includes only you and oh God we thank you tonight that we can ask you that in the midst of all of this that you will lead us to a place of compassion toward those who still need to receive you and Father that we will be able to extend your Father heart to them as we eat tonight as we drink father we do this in remembrance of the greatest gift of all the fact that jesus you came to pay for us that we deserve to die we deserve to have the, the eternal penalty of death because of our sin and yet jesus you gave us the opportunity to be free and tonight we choose the freedom in the name of Jesus. We eat your body because it represents your church. It represents your life in the name of Jesus. We drink your, your um, blood, the wine tonight as a symbol of, of the freedom that you brought for each one of us. The power is in the blood. The fact that you shed your blood and that makes us free. Oh God, tonight we ask you, come and cleanse us. Come and put those robes 
those white robes on us as well. Let us turn from our wicked ways. And Father God, let us, let us really experience you and your fullness in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Let's drink together. Father, we ask for your kingdom to come. For your will to be done. Father, even though it might be difficult, we as your Christians, as your people, as your sons, your daughters, tonight surrender to your will. And we ask you, Father God, to make it known to us. Speak to us, O oh God. Prepare our hearts. Make us ready so that we fulfill every part um, of which you have called us to do. Thank you for the privilege of uh, being part of your kingdom. Um, use us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen.